I was yelling through the intercom, bail out, bail out, not knowing that the driver and the forward gunner had both been killed instantaneously by a bazooka fired at short range. I sort of staggered out and I uh, fell or scrambled away from the tank and then found that what I thought was a ditch on my side of the tank was unfortunately a not a ditch at all. It was a trench full of Germans. I still have shrapnel from the war in my body. This production was made possible through the generosity of the Stanley W. Eskram Foundation. Thank you so much for believing in this mission. On a side note, Remember World War II is working on a special project that requires an iOS developer. If anyone watching is interested in World War II veterans and happens to have that expertise, please reach out on our website or at the email above. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christopher Hutchinson. It is such an honor to meet you, sir. Where and when were you born? I was born in Bambra, Bambra Hall, on the 5th of May, 1922. So that makes you how old now? 101 years. <laughs> My father was the local farmer in Bambra. He was a good sportsman as well, played rugby uh, for Durham and cricket. He was the local uh, cricket captain for Bambra, their wicket keeper. He was a great huntsman, fox hunting. He had his own horse, a great big black creature. I was terrified of it. <laughs> uh, that was him. And my wife, and my mother, I should say, is his wife. Um, she was very sweet. She uh, lived with him, of course, in Bamber Hall, and they used to go riding and hunting together. She rode side saddle. You don't see many people riding side saddle these days, do you? Uh, anyway, we lived uh, in Bamber Hall until 1929 when unfortunately my uh, father suddenly died and my mother was uh, left with uh, me uh, and my two elder sisters. They were about five and six years respectively older than me, paid no attention to me and I didn't pay much attention to them either. Uh, anyway, we had to move from Bambra. Uh, naturally, somebody else had to take over the farm and keep it going. So we moved to a little country valley, village in the middle of Northumberland called Callerley. And we lived there until war started. And uh, at that stage, I was sent to a prep school in uh, Scotland called Ardvrek, a very, very good school, thoroughly enjoyed it, and left that school, <coughs> Ardvrek, <coughs> and um, went on to an English public school called Charterhouse, which was in the south of England. And at Charterhouse, I uh, did the normal things that boys do there. I specialized in shooting because I had won a few uh, trophies for shooting, rifle shooting at Ardvrek. And at Charterhouse, I joined the officers' training 
uh, uh, what do we call it? OTC, Officers Training, what was the C? Core. Core, Officers Training Core. And I was two years in that, which uh, gave people, uh, gave one the outline, really, of what military life was like. And I carried on shooting there, uh, shooting, uh, rifle shooting, I should say. And uh, at um, Charterhouse, I finished up winning some prizes for rifle shooting at Bisley, which is the main rifle shooting uh, location in England. And then came back to England and the war had started by then. This was May 1940. May 1940, yes. At that stage, Churchill had just become Prime Minister. Anthony Eden was Foreign Secretary. Uh, Churchill became Prime Minister in round about the 10th of May, I think, 1940, that sort of time. You're doing absolutely fantastic. Your memory is incredible. Good. Well, from... Um, You're uh, just talking about May 1940. Which May 1940, yes. Well, at that stage, um, I wanted to leave Charterhouse because I had achieved whatever I needed there and I wanted to join the army and um, because war was taking place. Uh, but uh, my mother uh, said, I will make a bargain with you if you will agree not to join the forces for one year, then I will agree to you leaving school and coming home and finding a job for at least a year. So I said, fine. So I agreed to do that. And a few days after that, we were visited by an old friend called Major Friday Holderness Rodham, who uh, eventually asked me uh, if I was prepared to do a full-time job with no pay, which would help the government. And I said, yes, sir. So he said, right, now, in that case, I'm going to appoint you as a lieutenant in the new local defense volunteers force that has just been announced on the radio. And that was how I became to uh, be in charge of a local defense volunteer force. And this was centered on three villages close to where I lived, the village of Whittingham, the village of Alnham, and the village of Glanton. And my responsibility was to train men living in those areas who had volunteered for this force to defend their local areas if we were invaded by the Germans, which I did. And um, I did this for a year and trained these chaps and um, carried out exercises with them and I was given by the local association a car for the sole use of myself 
as a local defence volunteer officer for me to go to their headquarters, for instance, to collect stores, rifles, uniforms, ammunition, clothing, all this sort of thing. And I did this for a year, and at the end of the year, I said to my mother, I have done my year now. I really must join the army. So she said, all right, I won't put anything in your way now. So I left the home guard, handed over to uh, a friend who was a schoolmaster uh, in Annick, and he took over the platoon I had, and I then uh, went down to Newcastle and signed in and uh, took the oath of allegiance to the king, and it was a king then, of course, in 1941, and then joined the army. I was first uh, sent as a, a private soldier to Catrick Camp to train as a, uh, a member of uh, a tank crew, and I carried out training there for a very short time, and then I was selected to go to Sandhurst to uh, train as an officer, and this was in 1941. I was commissioned in 1942 into the Royal Tank Regiment, and as a second lieutenant, and my first posting was, strangely enough, up to a place called Hodham Castle in Dumfrieshire, near where you were going to go. Uh, and I joined up there uh, and reported to the brigadier in charge of 21 Army Tank Brigade. And he said, uh, nice to have you, young Hutchinson. I'm going to start your training as a, an officer in the Royal Tank Regiment by giving you command of our reconnaissance troop, which consists of 10 scout cars. So I then had charge of 10 scout cars and um, they were a type called Dingo, which is a small, very small, armoured, four-wheeled scout car that had the characteristic that um, it could travel in reverse as fast as this it could travel forwards. And this was very useful because if it was carrying out its wartime duties, which were reconnaissance, and it, for instance, if it was traveling along a track and there was a bend in the track and it went round the bend, and suddenly encountered the enemy, it didn't need to stop and turn round in the road. It just swung, uh, the driver swung his seat round and pressed a lever and the scout car travelled backwards in reverse up to 50 miles an hour. And I was training my troop of 10 scout cars each to do this. And unfortunately, on one occasion, um, the scout car got out of control when it was reversing very quickly. And <laughs> it ended up knocking down a telephone uh, cable. 
a big uh, telephone post. And of course all the wires came down. And in that part of the country, <laughs> there was no more telephone communication. And I got into serious trouble with uh, my brigadier when they went and told him this. And he said, well, that's a bad thing you have done. Will you accept my punishment or do you want to have a court martial? And I said, I expect, I accept your punishment, sir. And he said, right, you are severely reprimanded. That will go on your record for the rest of your career. <laughs> All my fault. Anyway, training ended. The king came along uh, in a few months' time and inspected all 21 Army Tank Brigade. And then we set off in February, no, March, early March 1943 for North Africa. Went in a convoy. I think there was one ship sunk by a German submarine in the convoy. But other than that, we achieved our destination, which was Algiers. And we landed in Algiers. And uh, at that stage, I had just been uh, moved from brigade headquarters to the 48th Royal Tank Regiment as a tank commander, which is what I had wanted to do all the way along. And eventually I got the job. Uh, we landed in Algiers, as I said, and it, it took a, a day or two to sort things out there when all the tanks from the regiment, a total of about 70, including the spare tanks, uh, were landed and degreased. And then they were put on uh, a local train and sent uh, towards the beginning of the battle lines in North Africa. And at that stage, <coughs> I was a, uh, a reserve tank commander, so that if any tank of the first line tank commanders of the regiment uh, were killed or damaged, wounded, then I would replace them. And that's exactly what happened, that uh, in the first battle where uh, the 48th RTR fought the Germans in tanks, we were fighting in our Churchill tanks and the Germans uh, had brand new Tiger tanks, which were very powerful and we knew that uh, their gun was very much more powerful than the guns or the armor of the Churchill and sure enough in the first battle that our tanks were involved with the Germans we lost two or three tanks unfortunately but one of our tanks uh, fired a solid shot at the German Tiger tank and by an absolute stroke of luck this shot landed in the one vulnerable place on the German Tiger and this was on the turret ring. This is where the turret of the tank uh, meets the body of the tank. And obviously the turret has to swing around every now and then and traverse all the way around. 
and the solid shot from our Churchill tank, not my own personal one, which I wasn't there at the time, but the solid shot uh, jammed the turret ring of the uh, enemy, the German Tiger tank, and <laughs> the crew all dismounted and scattered <laughs> because the tank was useless. It couldn't traverse its guns or move or anything like that with the uh, uh, damage it caused to it. Uh, unfortunately, at that same episode, uh, one of our tanks had also earlier on been knocked out and all the crew were either wounded or killed and my, I then was the first uh, uh, troop officer to uh, take over the space of the tank that had been knocked out. And from then onwards, I commanded number three troop of A Squadron in the 48th. And my tank I called Tangerine. After that, uh, it was obvious that the North African campaign was coming to an end because the main body of the British Eighth Army commanded by General um, oh dear. Montgomery, Montgomery uh, was proceeding rapidly towards where we were uh, in Tunisia. Uh, and when the two met, which they did fairly soon, uh, the last week or so of fighting as far as our tanks were concerned in the 48th Royal Tank Regiment uh, were quite simple. There was only one interesting activity, I think, and that was, as far as I was concerned, my tank uh, came through the cornfields because the corn was in complete uh, fruition at that time. And we were on the side of a hill, and I can't remember the name of the actual hill, uh, but I realized that um, a short distance ahead, there was a uh, uh, one of our infantry um, uh, vehicles with a section of infantry on board following up and I didn't know that our chaps were as close so it drew to a halt and I closed I <coughs> I stopped my tank about a hundred yards away from the infantry section and I jumped out of my tank and I ran towards the um, the uh, uh, scout car, the uh, uh, fellow, the infantry uh, chap in his vehicle and we talked uh, a few seconds about where we were and what was happening and where the enemy was and suddenly there was a terrific crash crash bang bang just like that and I looked around and fortunately both members of the infantry uh, Scout uh, wrecky vehicle had got out, and a enemy solid shot 
had gone through the driver's compartment and also the commander's compartment. And if they had been in the side the vehicle at the time, they would have both obviously been killed, but fortunately they were both out of it. I realized at that time that uh, things were a bit hot, so I'd better get back to my tank. So I ran back to my tank, and as I got very close to it, there was a big thump, and this was a German mortar shell uh, landing very close to my tank, uh, but didn't fortunately damage me in any way. But as I climbed back into my tank, I was sort of holding on to a piece of the mud guard of the tank that one normally does when you climb back onto the turret. And I, uh, I cut my finger really badly. And in fact, if you look, you can still see the, the mark on that middle finger of my left hand where I was pulling myself up on the tank to get in uh, into the turret at the top. And that's the only damage I uh, suffered, but it was very annoying to me. <laughs> so um, that caused uh, me to have a, a very bad temper after that because it was very painful, of course, we put a first field dressing on it at the time and um, that was the end of that particular activity. And I think the following day the two armies met, General Montgomery's 8th Army coming up from the south and um, General Alexander's 1st Army coming towards them uh, from the west. And that was the end of the uh, North African campaign. The vehicle that was hit, uh, the infantry vehicle, was a brain gun carrier. And uh, all this activity then took place in the early part of May. I remember particularly because May the 5th was my birthday and one of the birthday presents I had and I think probably the best one was uh, for officers particularly uh, doing away with battle dress and the issue of uh, KD, which was khaki drill, shorts and open neck shirt because the weather was becoming really quite hot. My other main present uh, on May the 5th that year uh, was in remembering it was my 21st birthday, was um, a gold watch from wristwatch from my mother. Uh, that ended the campaign, the fighting campaign in North Africa. As far as our tank battalion, and in fact all of 21 tank brigade, were concerned, we were told we're going to remain in North Africa, re-equip, retrain, and just stay there until they're called forward to the next phase in the battle, wherever that might be. And believe it or not, we stayed there for almost a year, 11 months, without being called forward. 
But one or two things are quite interesting during that time. Uh, for instance, because there were a lot of troops, apart from all 21 tank, Army Tank Brigade, uh, there are a lot of troops uh, in the same position as us. In other words, they uh, were mainly 8th Army troops and they were being re-equipped and retraining and just waiting for the next orders. And so a very large ordnance camp was set up in North Africa in uh, Tunisia and um, it was the one of the activities that we had to undertake was to guard this uh, RAOC stalled enormous place because although it was what we thought to be securely wired in with um, very sharp steel wire all the way round for miles because it was an enormous depot. <coughs> Unfortunately, we were losing a lot of kit, mainly food, sacks of grain and things like that. And every troop, every now and then, was ordered to send a detachment for 20 hour, 24 hour drill to patrol the area inside the wire and prevent at any manner of means uh, uh, local people trying to get in underneath the wire, dig like a dog underneath the wire, crawl into the store, uh, carry out ca a bag normally, uh, a sack of grain was what they were after, and steal it and manage to get it out. However, on one particular occasion, my troop was ordered to carry out this task, and sure enough, I gave them their orders that at all costs, they were to prevent us losing any stores. And to that effect, your rifles will be loaded and you might have to use them to prevent the stores being lost. During the night, I was working uh, in the little hut we had by a rifle a shot. I could hear the well-known crack of the rifle shot and I thought, oh God, what's happened? And sure enough, somebody came running back and said, I'm sorry, sir, we killed him. So I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, this horrible little Arab had somehow or other crawled into the compound underneath the wire and had snatched a big sack of grain and he'd got it out and he'd got it out and himself and then he got slightly stuck, this Arab got slightly stuck under half under the wire and he wouldn't let go and he wouldn't put it back and our chaps challenged him two or three times and so they shot him. We were doing our duty, we were preventing it from being stolen. Anyway, the outcome of that, of course, was a big stink. It's the first time any Arab had actually been shot. And of course, the civil authorities became very much concerned and they insisted that uh, Trooper Loverage, one of my own crew, Trooper Loverage would be charged with murder. And the army said, no, sorry, we don't believe that. He's doing his duty. 
And they said, no, look, you just killed a man, murdered him just for a sack of grain. And the army said he was carrying out his orders. And there was a big tussle between the military authorities and the civilian authorities. However, in the end, the civilian authorities said, uh, we will agree, therefore, uh, to compromise on this. And if you, the army, will agree to charge him under army procedure with murder, we will accept that. So a court-martial was formed and <coughs> Trooper Laverage was warned that he was going to be charged with murder. And he was asked, he said, now, uh, it's a civilian court and there are going to be military people attending it and um, we've got to carry out military procedure very carefully. You need to have a, uh, a really clued up officer to defend you. And they said, now, our adjutant, whose name escapes me at the moment, is a civilian officer, as a legal officer in his civilian capacity. We would thoroughly recommend that you ask for him to be your defending officer. And so Loveridge said, I'll just think about this. The adjutant, yeah, I know him. Yeah. He's a lawyer. Yeah. No, I'd rather have Lieutenant Hutchinson to defend me. <laughs> So I was, uh, no, no, I couldn't help it, but I have to agree. Uh, fortunately, my squadron leader uh, agreed to me having a week off duties in order to brush up on military law and go through anything I could to try and sort it out. And eventually, uh, this court-martial did take place under proper conditions and I'm glad to say that Loveridge was found not guilty. So I was pleased with that thing. Um, after that, uh, it was just a matter of retraining and re-equipping and filling in the time in various activities. And uh, we were warned that in a month or two's time we would be moved. We didn't know where or when. But sure enough, in a month or so's time, we were told that the whole brigade was going to Italy. And so <coughs> I was fortunate enough to be in charge of one of the uh, ships, British ships, that had been, no, it wasn't a British ship, it was a Dutch ship that had been commandeered to take uh, the squadron's tanks across. So we carried out the normal procedure of greasing up all the tanks beforehand, make sure that uh, they weren't damaged by seawater or anything like that. And we had a very peaceful crossing, uneventful, excellent food uh, on this ship and landed in Taranto of Italy, South Italy, a few days later. 
and then we started the journey up into Italy where of course at that stage the Italians uh, were um, against us. Italians had not given in at that stage. And we started our training with a Canadian infantry uh, regiment. They were known as the Van Doos, the Royal 22nd Regiment of Canada Infantry. Jolly good, tough soldiers they were too. And we trained with them uh, in South Italy as we gradually moved up. And the front line was probably 50 miles ahead of us, so we weren't actually fighting at that time. And then uh, eventually we uh, arrived quite near Assisi. And we were told that we are now temporarily leaving the Canadians and we as a tank uh, battalion, 48th RTR, are going to move now on American transporters and we are going through uh, Assisi, as I say, and we're going <coughs> um, across the other side to the eastern side of Italy instead of being in the center. And hopefully in two or three days' time, we should be in action. So sure enough, we did. We mounted on these wonderful uh, uh, American tank transporters, and we diamond, the diamond T. Sorry. The diamond T. The diamond T. Yes, the diamond T. And we. <coughs> they were very skilled drivers as well, because. They jolly well had to be. We were going over uh, some very nasty, rocky uh, tracks over the hills between Assisi and the east coast of Italy. And I think only one diamond tree fell into a crevice. But all the other ones managed to get home as we wanted to. Anyway, a day or so later, we arrived um, near a uh, an area of Italy uh, called Monte Luro. And this was, we had crossed the Mataro River, which was just a riverbed at this time of the year. And the date was September the 2nd, 1944. And the next river crossing was a river, uh, Mataro and the phase begins with an F. I can't remember. Anyway, the next river we had to cross the following river uh, again, which had dried up. And just after that, uh, came to the forming up area where. We dismounted from our diamond tees and they departed. We never saw them again. And we then became proper tanks on our own tracks. And we knew that um, 
probably the following day we would start moving forward uh, into the outskirts of the Gothic line. And sure enough, uh, that night, which was September the 2nd, uh, having uh, formed our normal lager, which tanks always do at night if there's any danger, that is, they form a circle, a wide circle, with all the tanks on the outside, with their guns pointing to the outside, so that on the inside you can rest assured that uh, there is peace <laughs> and you're not attacked. Anyway, we went into our normal lager and the RSM, the squadron sergeant major, came round as he always did all the way round to the troop leaders and said, right, how much petrol do you need? How many gallons of petrol do you need for three troop, for instance? And I told him that my tanks each needed 12 gallons of petrol, for instance, whatever it was. Uh, and ammunition, no haven't used any ammunition. Oil, yes. We all need a, an element of oil. P-O-L, petrol, oil, lubricants, no. Ammunition, no. It was only petrol that we needed that time. So sure enough, uh, an hour or so later, uh, the truck, uh, came into the lager and distributed cans of petrol that were needed to the tanks, which were then filled up. We'd had a hot cooked meal by the squadron cooks, and we waited now to see what was happening. Sure enough, we were then called forward <coughs> Uh, uh, the troop leaders were called forward by the squadron commander and he said, we are now going to do something quite different. We don't expect to go into action tonight, but we do expect to go into action tomorrow. And what we're doing tonight is instead of going roughly north into the Gothic line, we are going northeast. And the idea is that we are setting off and we're going to go cross country in Italy and we're going to cut off the main arterial highway that runs from the south of Italy, almost beside the east coast all the way, up to Remini. And we must get there before the Germans start pulling back, because a large proportion of the German army is based in the area that we are just approaching and they are trying to get back towards Rimini so that they can properly occupy the prepared Gothic line positions. What we must do is block the highway that I've referred to and prevent all their forces coming up and uh, going past, uh, getting, uh, prevent them from getting near Rimini. 
So the squadron leader looked around and he said, Hutch, you can lead the squadron on this one. <laughs> so I was detailed to be the lead tank going into the unknown uh, place not shown on any of our maps, starting where we were, which was just before uh, a mountain called Monte Lero, L E R O. Well, at this stage, when we started off uh, in the dark, it was a cloudy night with the moon appearing every now and then. But uh, basically, I was told to follow a track round the side of a mountain called Monte Lero and I would pass probably one or two hamlets but ignore them and just keep straight on with the track which points towards Rimini and we've got to get to the right of that track when we have neared the destination that we set out for. So I ordered the driver to drive as carefully as he could. Every now and then the clouds broke and the moon came through and we could see where we were. And at one stage, uh, the uh, sky was clear and my head was out of the top of the turret. And I looked around and I, the mountain was on my right and on my left uh, was a, a field as far as I could see. And I looked at this field to see if there was any life in it, animals, people, anything. And sure enough, suddenly there appeared in the break of the clouds where there was decent light, suddenly there appeared a section of infantry, six men walking parallel to my tank and just walking quite calmly and I could see them. They were only about 50 yards away from where I was. So I thought, wonderful, the Canadians, the Van Doos, our friends, have arrived after all. So I got on the telephone to my squadron leader and told him this, and he said, wait. And then he came back on the phone a few seconds later and said, you better close down, Hutch. <laughs> Those aren't Canadians. They're Germans. And I could feel at that stage <laughs> the hair at the back of my neck sort of moving. It's the first time I've ever in my life <laughs> actually felt the hair in the back of my neck. Right. So fairly quickly I put my head down inside the tank and I was very glad I did because suddenly there was a, whoosh, a swoosh and I could see through my periscope that there was something like a flaming onion coming whoosh, straight towards me and I sort of automatically ducked although I was inside the turret of the tank 
my head was no longer out of the top. And immediately I said, open fire, driver speed up. So having shouted that through the intercom, the driver then managed to get a few more miles an hour out of the old Churchill and both the front gunner with his Beza machine gun and also uh, my gunner beside me from the turret with his machine gun and they both had done what we always do in Italy. Uh, they check the belts of ammunition before they are loaded into the tank. And we always put in about one in four cartridges, which were tracers. Tracers, the word, yeah. The advantage of that is that at night time you can see through your periscope where the fire is going and furthermore uh, when it reaches whatever the target is at the other end, if you're lucky it might set it on fire, which actually it did in this case because there was a haystack in a farm, it transpired, had been set on fire by our tracers, so we were lucky. So, in addition to that, I had shouted down, driver, speed up! And the driver then did speed up, and unfortunately, at that stage, the clouds came over the moon and so we were almost in pitch darkness. And the poor old tank was hurtling along it as fast as it could, not knowing where the heck it was going. And suddenly there was an almighty crash something on the left-hand side of the tank and sparks and flame and all sorts of things came up and the tank started careering to the left as if it's his right-hand track had gone on a light wall or a, an embankment or something. And the tank, unfortunately, was now belching forth flame and smoke. And after a few seconds, it, it slithered to a stop on its side. And poor old Tangerine was no more as a fighting tank. She was on her side and flames were coming from her all over, particularly from the front. And I was yelling through the intercom, bail out, bail out, not knowing that the driver and the forward gunner had both been killed instantaneously by a bazooka fired at short range and to the side of the tank and that would set it on fire. Anyway, the um, wireless operator cum loader, third member of the turret, got out of his, uh, bailed out of his uh, exit in the top of the tank of the turret, which of course was a ground level because the tank was steering along the ground 
gradually coming to a halt. He got out quite easily and I tried to get out and unfortunately there is a thing called a snatch plug which is two cables. One is connected to my helmet and cable and then the snatch plug and the other end of the cable goes to the uh, radio set with all the connections on it there. And there is halfway on there, along this cable, there is this snatch plug, which means that if it's suddenly jerked like that, it'll break, which is what I tried to do, and I could not. My snatch plug would not separate. So I, the only thing I can do is tear off my helmet and chuck it on the floor of the tank and then I was able to climb out and I climbed out and unfortunately by that time I was uh, rather bloody and messy because a lot of uh, flaking pieces have been flying around inside the tank and um, I had caught them all over my body, my top part of my body, shoulders and arms and chest and this was uh, not very pleasant. Not very pleasant also my tunic, my top part was beginning to smolder because it had been uh, caught by some of these red-hot patches. Anyway, I managed to get out eventually and then my gunner beside me also, he could get out because I had cleared the turret. And I sort of staggered out and I uh, fell or scrambled away from the tank and then found that what I thought was a ditch on my side of the tank was unfortunately a not a ditch at all. It was a trench full of Germans. And at that point, unfortunately, they took me prisoner. And so that was how I was captured and they were quite good, I must admit, because they tried to put out the smouldering shoulders and part of my uniform that was smouldering away. And later on, they took me into their uh, trench just beside the road and they searched me. Fortunately, I was not wearing a Luger pistol, which was a German pistol, which we had uh, captured from them in North Africa the previous year. <laughs> but I wasn't wearing that. I was wearing a British uh, pistol. But I had been unable to use that. Yes. Uh, the Germans were decent people, but um, in, uh, as they captured me, one of them grabbed my wrist and saw this rather nice watch on it and they snaffled that, stole that. And then <coughs> they took me, as I say, uh, into their uh, trench for a short time and then when they realized that it was safe for them to move back that our tanks behind me had not been able to advance because there was poor old Tangerine lying crosswise across the track and they couldn't get past because there was a 
the mountain, Mount Ilero on one side, and the flaming tank of mine on the other side. And no way could they get past until somehow or other they'd been able to shift my tank, the dead tangerine. Oh, the Germans then took me, they handcuffed me, and they took me to a uh, first aid station. They marched me to that, and uh, first aid German station were well, honestly quite good. They didn't try to question me at all. They just treated me as somebody that had suffered injury and patched him up. And they did. They patched me up as best they could. And then they sent me somewhere else, not back to where I'd come from, but uh, somewhere else. And I was handcuffed the whole way. After I had been captured, I was taken by the Germans to a uh, temporary prisoner of war camp at near Mantua in northern Italy, just south of the River Po. Eventually, probably the following day or so, uh, we crossed the River Po in a uh, a German ferry boat, and we were very lucky to cross because at this time I was very glad of clouds because otherwise the RAF might have bombed the German ferry crossing the Po containing me. <laughs> Do you remember the names of your different tank members, your crew members? Yes. Ken Rice, Corporal. Ken Rice was my loader operator, and the gunner was Trooper Stormy Gale. And the two men were killed were a chap called Acklaw and a chap called Dooley. Acklaw and Dooley. I can't remember their first names, but they were the driver and the front gunner. They were killed instantly, yes. Well, now I could see when the tank was uh, on its side, I could see the great big mark where the bazooka had gone in on the side of the tank. And it was obviously that was the one that had caused all the damage and killed them outright because that was where their bazooka had penetrated the tank and started the fire. My tank, Tangerine, was the first tank of the squadron and there were 16 tanks behind me, all waiting to come on this track, which of course was now uh, impossible because a burning tangerine was halfway across the narrow track and nothing could pass it until the flames died down and we could have the tank moved. And just so I'm clear, when, when the tank got out of control, sir, the right side, it, it, it was almost going on, on a wall. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, it is. It was as if when the tank started speeding up, when I ordered driver speed up, when the tank started speeding up after that, it did, but the tank started tilting over to the left because uh, apparently, uh, there had been something like a low wall that the driver couldn't see because the cloud had covered the moon and he was virtually blind. What was the feeling when you jumped into the ditch and you literally jumped in yes. alongside the German soldiers? Yeah. 
bloody awful. <laughs> but of course, quite honestly, I was only sort of half there because remember I was riddled by all sorts of um, shrapnel pieces in my body and my uniform was burning, smouldering I should say, smouldering as the word. And um, I wasn't in a very good state to say anything. <laughs> You're quite a hum humble man and so if you don't mind me asking, for the record, tell us about those injuries you received. Uh, you mentioned that you were hit by pieces of shrapnel, but what damage yes. did they do to you? Uh, and where were you hit, if you don't mind us? Yes. Round about my chest and shoulders, particularly, because uh, I didn't really know it at the time, but uh, this, remember, was September 1944. We were married in 1946, in June 46, and I hadn't slept with my wife. She didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until, as I say, almost two years later that we were married. And as soon as we started um, going to bed together, she sort of said, you've got a funny body. <laughs> you've got all sorts of little bumps. And I said, what do you mean? And, well, she found all these little sort of bumps. And in fact, I've still got one in the back of my neck somewhere, which uh, I'm keeping quiet about because that happened uh, in Italy many years later. Uh, for some reason, I had to have a upper chest uh, x-ray in Italy. And I had this x-ray and the chap who gave me the x-ray in the Italian hospital said, now please make sure, sir, that you've uh, taken out anything metal. Uh, that you could have uh, false teeth or anything like that. So I did that. And halfway through the uh, x-ray session, he stopped and pulled it out and said, Sir, you told me you didn't have any metal. You have. You've got quite a large one in the back of your neck, didn't you know? I said, no, I just told you. He said, well, I had, I'm sorry, I had to stop the x-ray. <laughs> so as far as I know, it's still there. I haven't done anything about it. So we're now north of Mantua. Mantua is the town uh, south of the Po. Uh, OK. We're on the other side of the Po. Uh, we were then moved in cattle trucks on a long journey by German rail over the Alps and down into Germany on the other side. Uh, from there, there was a pause and we were given uh, a small amount of food And we continued the journey in German cattle trucks until we came to uh, Mooseburg, M-O-O-S-B-U-R-G, which is close to Munich. 
this is where we disembarked and we were marched a short distance into prisoner, German prisoner of war camp, Starlake 7A. Right? Starlake 7A was a permanent camp for other ranks, but a temporary camp for officers. And in the British officers section of Star Lake 7A, there were, I would think, round about, did I ever quote a number? 20,000. Uh, 20,000 prisoners in general. T yes. Uh, no, there's no number for officers. Round about 60 British officers in a separate compound. This number of 60 increased day by day as the Allied forces forced the German soldiers in uh, the north of Italy to move away. You see, as, as the battle up north uh, took place, the Germans gradually retreated. And uh, they obviously had taken some prisoners, and those prisoners were ended up in Star Lake 7A. And from September 1944 onwards, every week more and more Allied prisoners, both officers and other ranks, found were, uh, were delivered into Star Lake 7A, so that living conditions became very difficult and food conditions awful. The idea was that each prisoner of war should receive from his own nation a Red Cross food parcel per week, one prisoner, one parcel, one week. And this uh, contained highly nourishing food that helped the Germans bear rations of um, potatoes, soup, uh, occasional meat and black bread, but without a, a food parcel, uh, the food became awful. Um, living conditions did not alter at all for the period that I was there. We lived in large uh, huts and bunk beds and we were given I think it was one pillow and one blanket each, something like that, very little. We were also encouraged to find a, or make a friend in the camp, uh, in uh, uh, 
from your neighbors and share various activities with that neighbor. I was lucky in that I shared uh, my life in the camp with a fellow Carthusian who I knew slightly while I was at Charterhouse and he remembers me and he and I uh, became a pair as you might say and we did things together and um, several other people, the Coldstream Guards officer who was captured in Florence, made friends with the uh, Scots Guards officer who was also captured around about the same time. And so one did make friends or renewed friendship uh, with other people in the camp. But um, the, the life in the camp was very tedious. Uh, what can I say about it? Well, there was one occasion when I had really nasty toothache. So I spoke to the senior British officer who was the liaison between the British officer personnel and the German staff. I spoke to him and said, is there any dental facility I can use because I have violent toothache? And he said, leave it to me. <coughs> and he came back and he had spoken to one of the guards and the guard said, yes, there is. You need to speak to so-and-so. And so so-and-so so was brought to the edge of the camp premises and he spoke to the senior British officer who explained that one of the British officers had serious toothache. Uh, could they help? And he said, yes. Get your man to come with me now. And I was taken under guard, marched under guard to a building just outside the camp main entrance. And this building I went inside, it turned out to be a dental studio. And there was the dentist who actually was Russian, apparently. And he sort of pointed to my mouth and said something I couldn't understand what. And I opened my mouth wide and indicated that he should have a look. So he came and had a good look. And he said, ah, yes. Make good. So he obviously he was realized I was British and he hopefully was going to make this tooth for me good. He had no uh, proper dental facilities. He had a hand drill, sort of thing you use at home to punch it, what not. He had a hand drill and uh, he had a basin in the corner and various pots of different colour beside it and a few spoons, long handled spoons. And he drilled away at my tooth and it wasn't too sore, I must admit. I thought it was going to be absolute hell, but it wasn't too bad. He drilled away and then I could see him 
mixing together in a big pot, uh, presumably what was going to be the filling, turned out to be the filling and it turned out to be black. <laughs> but he filled my tooth, having removed most of the nasty part, and um, I had that filling in my tooth. Uh, no more toothache. It was wonderful. When I came back to England eventually and went to see a dentist, he said, what the hell's happened to her? <laughs> he couldn't understand. So I told him and he said, oh, well, if it's not hurting now, I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> but it was very successful. But life in prisoner of war camp was uh, uh, pretty dull. There was only one other nationality uh, compound that we saw at all, and that was one that was adjacent to uh, our compound and was occupied by around about 20 Russian officers. Uh, and um, I remember one incident with the German police that the Russian officers apparently refused to do something that the Germans wanted to do. So the Germans unleashed a rather vicious-looking dog and left it, pushed it into the Russian compound. Two days later, they went to recover the dog, but all they could find was a bit of fur and some bones. There was a situation that we prisoners couldn't understand that the Germans uh, seemed to have developed some kind of super fighter plane that was flying over us uh, fairly high in the sky and it seemed to be quite a different model with a different sort of speed and we didn't know what it was, no. That was the first jet. Yes, it was the first jet, apparently, yes. Every morning they used to have a roll call. And, of course, the number of British prisoner, British officer prisoners uh, virtually increased almost every day. And we made it difficult for the Germans because they lined us up in threes and they started to count and then one of our people from the front row would suddenly dart back into the back row and they'd already counted the front row and we used to, we used to upset them so much that they could hours and hours we were teasing them by people dodging or lying down or something hiding when the roll call took place. Uh, of course, it all came back to us that we were kept out in the open come weather. <laughs> but we used to tease the Germans because we uh, played tricks with them over the roll call by hiding. Some of us had packs of cards, you know, and we would play card games with other people. Uh, there were a few books which were well read. No radios, of course, unfortunately. Uh, one episode, I remember, that uh, one of the prisoners wanted some kindling wood I'm not quite sure why he wanted a kindling wood, but he did. He wanted kindling wood. 
and of course nobody had any kindling wood until the <coughs> German lorry, a particular lorry, came into the compound, which it did about twice a week, a specially built lorry, and it, its purpose was to suck up all the muck from the latrines into its big tank and then uh, disappear and take this out to the fields or whatever they did with it. Germans realized that, the German driver realized that uh, the packet of kindling wood uh, had disappeared. So he was very upset and he shouted in German, kindling wood, kindling wood, give him back. And of course we all strolled around and just sort of laughed at him and he said, I give you one minute. He looked at his watch. Give it back. And of course nobody moved. And at the end of the minute, the chap said, Right, it's on me. And he got back into his lorry and he started fumbling with some switches. And suddenly he spewed up into the air all the shit he had. I shouldn't say that word. All the um, uh, manure, manure <laughs> that he had sucked up into his tank. And it all went everywhere, all over us. And he unfortunately had the last laugh there because once he'd emptied his tank all over us, we tried to run away and get away from the, the deluge that was falling down. He drove off with a big smile. <laughs> I think I weighed just over 10 stone before. It was my normal weight, somewhere between 10 stone and 10 and a half stone. And <coughs> when we were liberated, and came back to England and were processed and cleaned and washed and everything and weighed, Apparently, I weighed just seven stone at that stage. One day, we could hear in the distance, in the camp, from the camp, I should say, we could hear the rumble of guns. And as the day grew on, so that became louder. And we realized that the war was still going on and the war was just a few miles away from our camp. And sure enough, the war got hotter and hotter and the guards became very agitated and friendly. <laughs> and after a time, American forces suddenly appeared outside the camp. And with the leading forces was General Patton himself. And I personally didn't see him because of where the main entrance was. Unfortunately, it's out of view of the officers, British officers compound. But I could hear what was going on. And German General Patton apparently leapt from his car and approached the entrance to the camp the main entrance, and he said, bring me the camp commandant. So the camp, German camp commandant was produced, and General Patton, we could hear 
a little bit of words and whatnot, but we weren't close enough to hear or see exactly what went on. But anyway, General Patton uh, organized our relief, and after a few moments, uh, he sent for the senior American or British officer. Well, there just weren't any senior American officers, but there was a senior British officer at that time. <coughs> and Patton spoke to the senior British officer and said, look, we're fighting troops, but I personally am going to organize your repatriation. I can't do it today, and I can't do it tomorrow, but I'll do it on the third day. And on the third day, what will happen will be this. I will send in hundreds of trucks, and these trucks will take you out of your camp and take you into Mooseburg. And in Mooseburg itself, they will deposit you for overnight only in civilian houses. Civilian houses which are occupied by German people. And I will arrange that these people will be moved out of their house for 24 hours. And in those 24 hours, you guys, you officers from the British War, <coughs> British Com Officers Compound, will be taken and each of you will be deposited in a house which the German, we have removed the German occupants just for 24 hours. And sure enough, when the day came, a few days later, lots of trucks arrived and as far as I was concerned, I was taken along with other people and I was dumped off at a certain number of a certain street and two American armed American soldiers with me. And these chaps knocked on the door of a house and somebody, uh, the occupant, uh, answered and the soldiers spoke in German to the owner of the, the occupant of the house and said, I give you two hours to get out and you'll get out for 24 hours and then you can come back to your house again. I want these British officers, and they know how to behave. <laughs> I want them to occupy your house, eat any food that may be in your house, sleep in your bed tonight and tomorrow at the same time you can return to your house. So that's what we did. <coughs> and exactly like that, the following day, as I say, <coughs> we were taken uh, American transport, armed guards arrived again, picked us up and took us <coughs> to took us to uh, Mooseburg Airport. There we were uh, loaded into a fleet of 
about 100 Dakota DC-3 aircraft and we were flown to uh, Chafe headquarters in France. <coughs> we stayed there overnight and the following day we were told we will be flying you to England. And the following day happened to be V.E. Day. Uh, the following day, okay. which turned out to be V.E. Day, the RAF big boys, the Lancasters, flew us back to England. And I remember once we arrived there, we were immediately taken on British transport. Uh, where we arrived in England, I don't know, <coughs> but it was an English airport somewhere near London. Could have been Heathrow, I just don't know. Anyway, the transport took us to the uh, uh, decommissioning uh, section, which had been specially set up. And there, the first thing they did was uh, de-loused us, stripped off all our clothing, shoes, underwear, trousers, shirts, whatever we were wearing, and chucked them in the bin, and then sent us for showers. And we had long showers, and then after a shower, they gave us a uh, kit with soap and flannel and toothbrush and uh, all, all the rest of it and said now dry yourselves and gave us towels so we dried ourselves and then they um, had a good look at us and weighed us and measured us and whatnot and they found that apparently I was seven stone almost exactly naked, which was a bit light for me. And uh, then they uh, went into another area and they kitted you out completely with underwear uh, and British uniform, battle dress. Yes, it was battle dress, not service dress. Battle dress and a berry and a badge. They got badges already, so I wore a tank badge. And then uh, they said, uh, go to the place next door. So we went there, and then we were given about 50 pounds, I think, in cash. And a railway ticket to wherever we wanted to go, and uh, a bank of telephones, so uh, they said you can use those telephones to telephone anyone you like, and we did that, and then uh, eventually uh, uh, we left there in army transport took us to a station, railway station and um, uh, as far as I was concerned I went to London and when I got out in London uh, of course London was not quite London as you think of it today but it might have been almost there because it was VE day. 
the eighth of May, nineteen forty-five, and uh, I said to the, uh, who did I turn it to? Oh yes, a taxi. I got a taxi from whatever station we arrived at in London, and I said, I want you to take me to. Uh, what's the LNER station in London? King's Cross. Was King's Cross. King's Cross. But on your way, stop at the first shoe shop you can find. So a chap said, OK. And stopped at the first shoe shop. And I went in there and I said, these shoes are bloody uncomfortable. Actually, I think they'd given me boots. I'm not sure, but anyway, whatever the foot gear yeah, I had been given uh, earlier on today uh, was very uncomfortable. So I said, here you are, take these. I don't want anything for them, but I want you to buy a pair of black shoes, please, that fit. So I did. I managed to buy a pair of black shoes at Fetter. And then eventually uh, I got to King's Cross. And uh, by that time, somebody, uh, oh yes, when I'd been at the um, uh, processing center early on and telephoned from them, I had remembered that Catherine, my younger of the two sisters, was in the land army. And of course, I'd been out of touch with her for over a year, so I didn't know where she was. But I hoped she was still in the land army and living with a lady uh, called Mrs. Cherry. And Mrs. Cherry's address? was to Providence Road, Durham City. As far as England was concerned, nobody in England apparently knew that I was a prisoner. They'd lost touch with me until one of my Home Guard men listened to Lord Haw Haw, who spoke on British radio each night after the news. And Lord Haw Haw gave details of English people who had been missing for some time and then found to be prisoners of war and safe. And Lord Haw Haw gave uh, my name as one of those. And uh, this chap of mine, uh, the fellow, the home guard chappy, uh, was rather a shy chap, and he didn't quite know how to do it, what to do next. So he got in touch with uh, Ginny's father, who was Captain Robson, and also had been my home guard commander, and told Captain Robson that um, I had been uh, I was now a prisoner of war and I was safe. And please would uh, Captain Robson pass the message on to my mother so that she would know that I was safe, which he did. You're 101, uh, sir. You've, you've lived such an incredible life, met so many different people uh, along the way. What is some advice 
that you want to give to future generations, your great, great, great grandkids, you know, what do you want them to know for their life? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Meet all situations with a smile and try and overcome difficulties. <laughs> That's beautiful. The world we live in today is so divided. People are so angry. It's a very different world than the one you yes. grew up in. Uh, and it, not just in America, but here and really across the world. What can future generations do to make you feel, as someone who almost died in, the world, in World War II, as someone who is willing to give his life, what can future generations do on a societal level to make the sacrifices of all those who did perish in the war worth it? Uh, I think the best advice I can give is to adopt Christianity. Well, it's, uh, I mean, I know it's a true story. Uh, when I visited uh, St. Francis Cathedral in Italy, in Assisi, uh, I said to him, I said to one of the English-speaking wardens of the cathedral, I said, I remember reading about the story about um, the garden of St. Francis Garden in Assisi. Where is it? And he was a bit taken aback. And he said, uh, I will show you, which he did. He got out a big bunch of keys and he said, come with me. So we walked out of the main entrance of the St. Francis Basilica and we walked up a gradual slope leading towards the center of the town. And it was a, a sort of wide open space uh, set at an angle. And we walked up the left hand side of this and about just over halfway up the guide stopped and he said, I will open the door. And I hadn't noticed that there was a door just where we had stopped, a door on the left. And he got his keys out and he opened the door and he pushed it open very gently. And he said, there, you can have five minutes in there and it's a most beautiful garden with all sorts of shrubs and flowers and butterflies and happiness and peace and I walked around there for about five minutes and I thank God that I had got as far as this and asked him to look after me and then he came back. And while we lived in Italy, we went to Assisi several times. And several times, both Ginny, who speaks excellent Italian, and I have spoken to the, the custodians of the basilica there and asked them if we could Please now go and look at the garden of St. Francis. And they look surprised as if they didn't know anything about it. And they would not 
none of them would ever admit there was this God. And I know there was. It was eerie when I read that paragraph, because I've interviewed an American soldier stationed in Italy who has the exact same story. Oh. In the sense that he went there, oh. saw this garden you're talking about. Gosh. Yeah, I don't, and well, he hasn't I'm been glad back. of that. Yeah, so I, that's why I thought it was very... It, it's, and it's such a powerful image. You go, you go there, this beautiful garden, and you're saying a prayer. Yes. And then you return to your tank. Yes. It's it's like in the middle of war. Yes. Absolutely. So I think that's the most powerful thing for us to end this on. I am so honored you've taken the time to visit with me. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too long. No. But you've done it's you fine. Were, you've done such a good job, and all I can say is God bless you. Thank you for what you've done. People like me are alive because of what you went through, sir. And ah. that's something no one can take from you. Thank you. It's, it's such Thank a you. pleasure. So let me quickly get packed up so I can get out of your hair. Joe's talking to your feet. Yes.